usually. There we go. There is the recording in progress. For any Ontario lawyers, just a reminder that you are able to claim one and a half hours of professionalism from this book club conversation this evening. Just remember to record it in your uh, in your LSO uh, directory and in your into the portal. And as I start, I wanted to also say the following. We are here to have a conversation. We're here to learn together, to have open, brave, and powerful conversations. Those are two words in particular that Kathy speaks a lot about and we will be speaking a lot about. But I also acknowledge the work of uh, an author, Elise Ahankora, who I just re came to the attention of recently. And in her article, she mentioned that some people might find that uh, for them, brave spaces may be exhausting. And, and um, uh, you know, we can talk about that. But in the meantime, what I asked to do is that we all have an accountable space today. And I sent out some notes recently to all of us. And I'm going to ask for all of us and I will do my level best to ensure that that this space for all of us is an accountable space. Um, so I'm hoping that we could move forward with that. I'm going to stop sharing this screen. We'll bring it back. I want to see your lovely faces or the names of everybody. Gina, hello from out west, I think. Nice to see you. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's nice to see everybody. Um, so, Kathy, uh, welcome to you. Many people that I speak with often tell me that they wish that they could speak to people about what their career journeys are like, that they crave to be able to find out why one person chooses one direction or what happens to them to move them into another direction. And you've had such an incredible journey, uh, such an incredible career story from your early work right out of college, perhaps even before that, um, to your present global career um, career breakthrough coaching work that you do. So can you share with our guest today, today briefly about your career journey? Um, how and why did you start each of the roles that you had and how and when did you move on? Um, over to you. And again, thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much, Gina. I, I'm so thrilled to be here. I'm trying to get my view so I can see everyone and can see myself and I'm not looking over here. It's not working so well. So <laughs> I might be looking over here if that's okay. Uh, but I'll try to do this as much as possible. And so nice to see all of you. Uh, I, I echo what Gina is saying. I really hope that you have questions after we speak. So do put them in the chat if you would and make, make them as specific as possible. I love answering questions. I hope that's okay. All right. My career journey. I could talk for about 10 hours about that. So, you know, the challenge will be keeping me brief, but here it is in a nutshell. When I even look back, uh, I'll go back even before high school and college, uh, you know, when I was 16, 17, there were things that I loved and that I had a natural talent ab about, and yet I didn't recognize that those were natural talents. And I'll tell you what they are later, but I did know that I loved writing. I loved ideas. And I remember mom, who's Greek, just like Gina, I would say, mom, I'm bored. And she'd say, read a book because my mother, who was not college educated, read a book a week. This woman was voracious. So I'd be like, oh, I'll read a book. I loved ideas. I loved just even the smell of books. So I went to college and thought I might want to be in the media. So I started one class in School of Public Communications at Boston University, hated it, became an English major. And so it was all about the English language and brilliant ideas, you know, spent a year in London studying British authors. Amazing. So I get out of get out of college and my dream was to work at a huge fiction house in Manhattan. That was the dream. Penguin or Simon and Schuster or Random House. Well, I'll tell you that I bailed on that dream about four weeks after graduating. So I had gone to NYU for a publishing institute. So I knew this is what I wanted. Yeah, well, I got a, an apartment in Brooklyn with three friends and I needed money. And so back then, I'm, I'm, I'm older than most of you. Uh, you know, we sent out resumes with S Smith Corona typewriters, typed resumes. So I got a job as a marketing assistant at kind of this unknown publishing house in sciences, which was not me in any possible way. Dad was a scientist, but not me. I took it oh, and, you know, I didn't like it from day one, but good girl, Kathy takes the job to, to make the money. And then two weeks later, a huge publishing house in New York said, hey, we got your resume. 
uh, you know, for assistant editor, would you like to come in and interview? What do you think I said? I to myself, I can't do that. I can't take a job four weeks after taking this first one. So I didn't go. So this is mistake number 1,722 from my journey, right? I didn't. So what happened was for 18 years, I was in the corporate world in marketing. Some years were in publishing. I spent nine years at Macmillan Book Clubs in doing market research, developing new book clubs. That was fun. But overall, I'll tell you that it never was a great fit for me. On top of that, I struggled with the corporate world. I struggled with leaders who I didn't think were leaders. I struggled, you know, I always say I don't suffer fools lightly. I'd be in meetings thinking, I don't understand what's going on here. Um, so it went on and on, but I didn't realize I was really in the wrong direction till I hit about 40 and I'm 62 now. When I hit 40, the bumps that I faced turned into full-blown crises. I faced sexual harassment. So I was a vice president at this time, making a lot of money, uh, managed $30 million budgets, you know, big responsibility, global initiatives. I faced sexual harassment, gender discrimination, toxic colleagues, narcissistic bosses, zero work-life balance, chronic illness. I had an infection of the trachea of all things. They called it tracheitis and they just plied me for four years with antibiotics, doctors. Hmm. But worse than all that was waking up every day saying, is this what I'm going to be doing with my life? My life. Now, I had little kids at the time and they're 25 and 28 now. And, you know, that part of my life, I felt like, okay, this is rocking it. I loved it. But the rest of it was pretty much a disaster. But it looked successful on the outside. That's the confusing thing. You know, people would say you're so successful. But internally, I was anything but successful. So, Lesson number 2000, I didn't do anything. I didn't know what to do. I was 40. My husband, we're divorced now, but very amicable. So grateful for that. He is a jazz percussionist. So he was the creative, the creative person I kind of wished to be. But we needed the money I made. We needed my 401k. We needed the benefits. So I didn't know what to do. And so I did nothing. And we decide to move to a bigger home in a more affluent area. And one of the senior leaders at my company said, buy the biggest house you can. You have a long career here. We Yikes. move into the, we move into the home. One month later was nine 11. And one month later I was laid off in a way that was really, I would say pretty brutal. So, the next part of the journey is good girl Kathy says, wait a minute, I've absolutely had it. I've had enough. And one of my colleagues who got laid off, another woman, senior woman said, I'm going to a lawyer. Some of you are lawyers, right? Love you. Love you people. <laughs> I went to a lawyer and I told him things that had happened. And he said, you have something here. I will never forget those words as long as I live. You have something here. And he wrote a letter on my behalf. And within two weeks, I had a settlement. And I, I know this is a long story, but I'm going to give you the context. It's almost over. I'm sitting in my therapist's office one week after being laid off crying. And he said another set of words I'll never forget. I know from where you sit, it's the worst crisis you've ever faced. But from where I sit, it's the first moment you can choose who you want to be in the world. Now, who do you want to be? So this is something interesting. If any of you ever feel stuck, if you are stuck, you can't answer that question. So I blurted out, I don't know, but I want to be you. And we all, we laughed. He laughed and I laughed. And he goes, what does that mean to you? He was a great coach, even though he was a spiritual psychotherapist. I said, I, I just want to help people, not hurt people and be hurt. Isn't that interesting? So he said, there's a program, marriage and family therapy. I've known you two years. I think you might be a great therapist. And there were two of those programs in Connecticut where I live. From that discussion, I became a marriage and family therapist, but it doesn't end there. We're getting to the end. It was life-changing to become a therapist. 
absolutely life-changing. I mean, I dealt with clients who were dealing with rape, incest, pedophilia, suicidality, drug addiction. I had one client whose mother called, he was 40 and the mother called, he's not coming in, he's in jail. He tried to kill his girlfriend and I had met the girlfriend. I mean, this is what I was dealing with. That wasn't the ultimate place for me for a number of reasons, but the training in, and learning to sit with almost anything was life-changing, but I found career coaching and particularly with women who had been through what I'd been through. Not all of that, of course, but who came with depression or confusion or they were in a swirl or they wanted to pivot. So now it's been, it's 17 years of coaching women. And, and I also got back to writing. So, you know, I have a Forbes blog and wrote two books and, and every day there's some kind of writing going on. So I would say that I reconnected to those talents that make me who I am and make me feel very joyful to be alive. So that's, that's the journey. I think that's really an incredible journey. And that question that was really powerful, right? That you were asked, who do you want to be? Um, you were, you reminded me just, as you said, you reconnected to writing. Um, my sister can attest to this. My, my two nephews who are not that far away from me in age, whenever we'd be babysitting them, I would play teacher. I'd get them and they, they'd roll their eyes. Gina, again, we're doing this teaching thing. But again, that was something that I enjoy doing. It brings back something that you're a natural or that you naturally are inclined to, but being asked that question, given permission to answer who do you want to be? I think is really powerful, really powerful. I don't think I've ever had ever asked myself that. Yeah. Or I didn't process it the way he said it. I mean, really, what a powerful question. Not what do you want to be? Who do you want to be? Yeah, I think that's really critical. And, and let me ask you this before we dive into the book. And I know there's a... Um, uh, at least one male in the group, a few, uh, many, most of us are women. Um, but you have co coached males and females. You have coached thousands of people globally. Um, and you and I, I think both have this, this um, experience that there is some planning that's required. There is some uh, reflection that's absolutely required. But somewhere along the line, serendipity happens, those chance encounters that happen in our life. And I wonder if you could share with us in terms of your career, um, how much of it was strategically planned? And you gave us a bit of, of, of insight in it. But how much of it was more those chance occurrences that you recognized as chance occurrences and then pursued them? What a fantastic question. So I have a take on that. You know, I think everything that I've gone through, and to be honest, when um, when the layoff happened, I went through this spiritual growth journey. I studied energy healing. I put my hands on people and wow, some amazing things happened. But I became more open to a, I, I would say, a more spiritually connected. And I do not mean religious. I mean that I connected to something that was higher the, or bigger than just this, right? And I got on the journey of that. From the moment of doing that, I was open to serendipity. I, in fact, I don't believe in chance occurrences. I believe, I don't believe they're coincidences. I, in fact, I interviewed on my podcast, Finding Brave, Christian Bush, who wrote a book about the serendipity mindset. I highly recommend it. Maybe it could be a book you do. Um, and he has studied, the man is brilliant. Um, Oxford, I think he went to brilliant and he's a scientist and a researcher. And he studied, you know, when you look at people who seem incredibly lucky, what is going on and what he discovered in this research is there are mindsets that you can embrace that expand what looks like luck. It's not luck. It's, it's how you're approaching things and how you're seizing opportunities and how you're looking for opportunities. I would say that this second part of my life, I'm much more open to serendipity and I'm much more open to signs and honestly, sometimes there'll be such a confluence, like I'm in one now, the amount of coincidences are so stunning that they can be, it's like, what is happening here? You know, you hear a name and then you hear something else. And then for instance, I'll give you an example. Today, I interviewed a person who's written the books. Uh, oh no, what's the title? His name is Andre Solo and it's coming out now. And it's about 
highly sensitive people. If you ever have thought you're sensitive, read this book. But two days before, another person um, just reached out to me. We be, we began talking. He's a highly sensitive person, HSP, and and I was talking to him about what I feel in life, which is I can kind of sense what a person is feeling. I can sometimes sense what they're thinking. And he said, oh, you're a burden bearer, which I'd never heard of. And I went scooping on the internet. And what does, what pops up? An article about highly sensitive people versus burden bearers. And who am I interviewing? A, an author about highly sensitive people. Uh, it, it's just simply incredible. But to give you a straight answer, I think that the first 18 years, it was very strategic and it was about success. I want to make more money. I want to advance. I want to have more responsibility. Ugh. That definition of success too, That, right? definition. that definition. Never, never did I say, are these my natural talents? And here's another thing. You're not going to be happy if you, let's say you like marketing or you like law, but you're in a firm where you don't respect anyone and they don't respect you, or you don't respect the outcomes the firm is delivering. You're not going to be happy. So strategically, I thought I was going in the right direction, but it was only till I was, you know, I call my first book is Breakdown Breakthrough. Sometimes it's only breakdown that allows you to have a breakthrough. And since I've had the breakthrough at age 41, I would say serendipity is very important to me and has, you know, has kind of changed everything. I uh, I thank you for that. And I want to look up the uh, the book that you talked about. Uh, for those of you who are online, who remember Peter Hogg, uh, he was a um, uh, law prof at one of our law schools here in Canada, who was from New Zealand originally, and came and was told in Canada, you're going to teach constitutional law. And he never knew anything about constitutional law. And he tells a story about, okay, he took it because he needed the, the role. And uh, down the road, he has become one of the, he became, he's since passed, unfortunately, but uh, he became the foremost person in Canadian constitutional law. Uh, and anybody who remembers Peter Hogg or Dean Hogg uh, can account for that. But at his graduate, at his the graduation remarks when he was dean for five years, the first time it happened, it it took me by surprise. And then every year, because he kind of used the same speech to the different classes, um, I would wait for the serendipity quote because he would say, and as you know, in life, I know that all of you think you have to have everything planned out, you know, in order. But let me remind you to make way for serendipity. And each time he said that, I just got this thrill in my in my spine. So thank you for sharing your serendipity story and uh, and that mindset book that we'll uh, we'll look into. Gina, can I say one more thing about that? Being a coach and in, in, in the arc of people's lives, uh, you know, in their lives for several years, what we think of and dream of for ourselves, it's there's so much, uh, there's so much more. Mm. So if you stick so doggedly to your plan and you're not open to what the universe also wants for you. Um, you're actually, that plan is going to derail you truly. Not yeah. that, not that we don't have goals. Don't get me wrong. Goals are great. Mm -hmm. I make them for six months, a year, five years, 10 years. But if you stick so doggedly to them, you're missing kind of what could be. That's Absolutely. what I would say. No, absolutely. Thank you for that. And let's go into the book. So the most powerful you. And remember everybody, if you have questions, please put them in the chat for now, or you could join us uh, uh, towards the end as we uh, open up the Q&A live. So um, the book, first of all, I love the quotes that you offer. And I'm going to start us with one of the quotes that I, um, you know, I, each chapter I kept saying, oh, this is such a great quote. And then this is an even better quote. But the chapter three quote just stayed with to me. grab the book. What's that? Oh, I yeah. need to grab it. <laughs> That's okay. I, I've got it here for us. Um, my life has been long in believing that life loves the liver of it. I have dared to try many things, sometimes trembling, but daring still. But Maya Angelou. 
and she's one of our my favorite people and and that quote from her just really um you know sometimes trembling but daring still i think mm -hmm. is really a good reminder to all of us and and let me ask you what was your you know your trembling moment what was your why for this book why did you have to what was it that drew you to engage in this book and to put it out there in the world what was your why oh, i love it so i i find in in doing this work um coaching speaking training if I'm saying the same things, if I'm finding I need to say the same things over and over and over, and, you know, I work one-on-one, -on -one, but I work with, you know, 100 people or sometimes 500 people, but when I'm saying the same things, I know that there's, there's something here that's impacting millions. I learned that as a market researcher. The woman, uh, Ann Dobbs, who's just passed away, she was such a mentor who would run the focus groups, would say to everyone at the start of the group, I need to hear from each of the 10 of you because each of you represents millions like you. So when I'm saying something over and over, it represents millions of people. And I know there are some men on, on the call and I embrace that. Thank you. And I do want to say I'll be talking about women, but I've heard from so many men who've said, I've read your book and I have these gaps and 90% of men who took my survey say they have these power gaps and 98% of women. So I do have a, a lens about female issues, but I hope that everything I share is helpful for you. But what happened was about five years ago, I said, what is going on here that no matter, so I work globally because I work online no matter where these people are calling, no matter what level, no matter what country, no matter what industry, no matter how much money they make, no matter the education, they are bringing the same challenges over and over. What is happening? So I wanted to answer two questions. What are they missing in their lives and careers that bring them to get help? And number two, what are they getting from working together that allows for breakthrough. And that is what I go for. I'm not like other coaches. A lot of coaches are taught, don't talk about the past. That's nonsense. We are what our childhood taught us to be. And don't go deep because that's therapy. Um, they're taught a lot of things. I don't agree with uh, some of that at all. But what I began to see was they're missing two things. They're missing the bravery to face head on what is not working and take accountability to change it. But that's not enough. The second thing is power. The power to be your own author of your own life, to be a change agent for yourself and others. You can be brave all you want, but if you don't have internal power and access to external power, your, your ability to shape your life and others is really limited. Now, I have to add this. The name of the book, I wanted to call it Close Your Power Gaps. But when we were talking to HarperCollins Leadership, the great publisher that published, they said, we don't like that because no one knows what those are. So come up with some other titles. So we did a survey and I came up with The Most Powerful You and that one. I only find out later because I do, I have a big following on LinkedIn and I do polls. I mean, thousands of people complete these polls that women told me, I don't want power. I said, well, what do you want? And they said, I want influence. I want impact. I don't, I don't want power. And I say to you, and I say to them, I hate to break this to you. You cannot have influence. You cannot have impact. You can't do what you want to do if you don't have power. Now, for the guys listening, I know why we shun power, women, because briefly, we're in a patriarchal world. This is not to bash men. This is to say in, in business, in work, it's patriarchal. It's mostly dominated at the highest levels by men. When you're in a patriarchal world, quickly, and I learned this from a therapist, Terry Real. You can find that on my Finding Brave podcast if you're interested. He said, when we are in a patriarchal world, you split yourself in half. There's the feminine and there's the masculine. And there's these rigid stereotypes, gender stereotypes. Masculine is, and you could probably just say these words 
before I say them, but what do you think masculine means in our society? Typically means strong, not vulnerable, not weak. You know, there's, there's a research study done with boys who are like four and five, and they were asked, what is it to be a boy? And they said, five-year-olds, don't be a pussy, excuse my language, don't be weak, don't be vulnerable, don't have girls who are friends, never cry, never show you're afraid. If that's how you're raised, your connection to yourself and to others is severely hampered. Anyway, for women, we've been under the gun of power that has hurt us. I mean, it's look at the statistics on who has been discriminated against, how many women have been sexually abused or sexually harassed. I've had, I've been sexually harassed. So um, when I generated this, back to your question, Gina, I wanted to say, well, what is bravery and what is power? Let me dimensionalize it. So in looking at a lot and all of these, I want to tell you that every one of these gaps I have had, I have lived and had, not one of them doesn't resonate with me. Same as my first book, uh, Breakdown Breakthrough, which were the 12 hidden crises working women faced. I had them. I had them all. So there's no judgment here. And then when I did the survey to see, okay, let me quantitatively test how many women and how many men have these 1600 people answered the survey and 98% of women said they have at least one of these gaps and 75% have three or more. And if you have that many gaps, I will say a bold statement, you cannot thrive in your work. And I will also say, I think all of these pertain to your per uh, personal life as well. The way I intervene is through careers, because it's kind of a safe way for, for people to look at their, what's going on, but all of this pertains to your personal life as well. Does that answer the question? That was a long winded. No, answer. it does that, that why I mean, seeing things repeatedly um, and, and being able to sort of take that look and say, okay, if I'm seeing it five, 10, 15, a hundred times, there's got to be something there. And then being able to delve into it, I think is really helpful. And, and let's go into, because the second part of the title of your book, so the most powerful you is the first part, seven bravery boosting paths to career bliss. So first of all, you talk about career um, gaps. And I wondered if you can just go through briefly, and um, those of us who've read the book, each chapter outlines one of those gaps. You talk about the power gaps, and then you also talk about the power, um, uh, how we fill those power gaps, right? And so can we just spend some time, if you can just remind us of those power gaps? And I see people are answering in terms of how they love would define it. masculine and feminine. I really love this because, you know, there's there's that much um, commentary about how we present in the world, right? Uh, and and I'll say one is, is typically seen as quote unquote good, and the other is typically seen as bad, especially in the business world or in the professional world or in, in our, in our um, not just in our work worlds, but also in the, um, in the personal worlds that we have too. But let's, and I, I, I see a lot of these. So let's go through to, um, to yes. the, the question about um, the power gaps. What are they? Okay. What are the seven of them? So I'm going to, I'm going to read them to you, but also give you a statement that reflects what it really kind of looks like in the world. And I'm going to give you the percentage of women who said they have this gap. Mm -hmm. You're going to be shocked. Number one, not recognizing your special talents, abilities, and accomplishments. And what that looks like, what people say when they have this is, I have no idea how I'm special or unique or talented. I don't think I have any special talents. I just want to say one quick thing about each of these, if I could. I have something called a career path assessment, which is 11 pages of questions I wish someone had asked me 20, 30 years ago. And if I'd answered them more honestly than I think I ever thought, I don't think I would made would have made some of the mistakes I made in my career. There's a question, how do you stand out? What are your special talents? I want to tell you, so many women leave it blank. I mean, I've worked with doctors. I had an anesthesiologist who said, I don't think I have special talents. So I just want to hit home and say, I said to her, do you think I could do your job? <laughs> and she's so humble. She went, I don't think so. I said, you don't think so? Could I possibly kill someone in the first week of trying to do your job? She goes, yeah, I, I think you have some special talents. I mean, I get really worked up about this. 
women won't see it. And some of the men too, they leave it blank. And there's a reason they will, and we'll, we'll talk about it. Number two is communicating from fear, not strength. What this means is I can't, I can't speak up assertively, confidently, or authoritatively. And this was me. When I do it, you know, one, once my boss called me a buzzsaw. And I said, what is that? And he said, you get it done. Yeah, do you, do you think that was a good thing to be a buzzsaw? No, it wasn't a good thing in his mind. Um, 70% said they have this gap. Number three is reluctance to ask for what you want and deserve. Here's what people say who have this. I'm not sure I deserve more. And even if I do, I don't know how to ask for it. 77%. Aye. Number four is isolating from influential support. What I would see is I would talk to people and I've worked with, you know, low level all the way to CEOs and doctors. And here's an example. If remember before Zoom, your CEO might have a lunch and learn and, and you know, or a senior leader. And you're, I would ask my client, okay, you're, you're going to go to that, right? Where are you going to sit? I'm going to sit as far away as I can. No, you're not. You're going to sit next to the CEO, not to kiss up, but to connect, right? To ask a question, to show your thought leadership. Well, women are isolating. Now, interestingly, this is what they say. I hate networking. And I'm reluctant to connect with people I don't know who may be able to help me. The research shows that women have three times as many mentors, but men have twice as many sponsors. Sponsors are high level mentors with power, with influence, who can open doors for you that you can't open on your own. So women tend to stay in the same room, women there and women and men who have this gap where they're comfortable. They're not networking up. All right, 71%. Number five is acquiescing instead of saying stop to mistreatment. Here's what people who have this gap think or say, I'm afraid to challenge the mistreatment that I'm facing or that I see around. <laughs> Sandra, you got a love bug there. Oh. I'm afraid to challenge the mistreatment I'm facing and the unba unfair behavior around me. Now, interestingly, 48% say this. It's more than that. It's more than that because it's, you know, every woman I've ever talked to has had some mistreatment. And if you look at the data, it's there. I think we, number one, don't want to admit that we're not doing anything about it. So this is a self-reported, you know, study. I think they don't want to admit it. Number six is losing sight of the thrilling dream you had for your life and career. This one is 76%. And when I ask people, if you had any more than one gap, which is the most pressing, this is the one they say. And it means I, it means I had a dream when I got out of school or early on and I've lost it and I don't know how to get it back. Number seven is allowing, now this is interesting as a writer, I know that the way I phrase things is, is either going to resonate or not. And sometimes I choose a word that doesn't resonate it much. This is allowing the past and past trauma to continue to define you and shape you. 62% that said that's them. And it means I'm devastated or upset, or I have pain over what's happened in the past. And it's still with me. It's still shaping me. I wish I had changed the word. Oh, not, it's not, because I'm a former therapist, I'm comfortable saying trauma. You can have trauma from the smallest thing. Your teacher saying you're stupid, your teacher embarrassing you, your boss humiliating you, your, your colleague putting you down and laughing at you, your friend in fifth grade who turned on you, that can be trauma. So it doesn't mean, you know, you, you're in war necessarily. I mean, trauma is on a spectrum. So what I see is that so many of us carry pain from the past and some of it is how we were raised. Some of us had narcissistic parents or unloving parents or parents who told us we had to hit this high, high bar. So a lot of us carry trauma and it's still with us. And that was 62%. So those are the gaps. Kathy, I mean, each of these, one of the things that I really loved about the, uh, about the book was that each of them, um, 
you offered an actual uh, an example, right? A, a person from your 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 work that you um, have shared their words of how they experienced it. And I've got to say they were all powerful, but the selection that you made for that last one about trauma was incredible. Um, I think that was a Cheryl really, Hunter, right? Yeah, that that was an incredible story that she has gone through and that she explained and that she expressed how she also got past that, but. There were uh, so many of those examples that you offered were like, oh, yeah, good. I, I can see myself or I can see somebody else in, in each of those. And I think it was really oh, useful so to have those examples. And I, on the last one, I'll just say, because some of the people on the uh, on the call um, are in the legal profession, there is such a push. Um, I say such a push, but there's more of an acknowledgement uh, a lot of lawyers practice in a trauma informed way these days, recognizing that the clients that come to them and not just in family law, people assume it's family law, criminal law or um, or uh, uh, immigration law, for example, in the refugee sense. But um, a lot of people will present with trauma. And you the fact that you also just reinforced right now. Trauma doesn't necessarily mean only, quote unquote, the big things, right? The refugee who's gone through war, um, the family uh, law client who has experienced um, uh, abuse, the uh, the um, criminal uh, client who has experienced so much horror throughout their life. It can mean some of those things that to us individually, we're the ones that indicate whether or not it's it's stunted us or, or moved us, uh, allowed us not to move forward. So I think including the examples, including the word trauma, while I heard your hesitation, um, I think there's, it's the right word to use, at least in, uh, in the way that many people experience it. Thank you, Gina. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Yeah. And I do think, you know, in some ways women and, and so many men are warriors. You know, I remember I have, as I said, two kids, I worked until like the last three days of, you know, out <laughs> to here, pregnant, you know, um, we're warriors. We're tough. We tough it out. And I think that's awesome, but we don't want to admit the vulnerabilities. We don't want to admit that what that person said to me is still rattling around in my mind and making me feel an imposter or less than or but it it we can't address it if we don't look at it you know yeah and sometimes it lies dormant right sometimes it lies dormant oh, until yeah. there is a trigger that that comes up um but we've got those power gaps so you identified you know the power gaps but you didn't just identify the power gaps. You then did something about them. So tell us a little bit about, you know, that phrase, the bravery boosting past that, that you've allotted to each of the, um, the power gaps that you see. Yeah. So, you know, I, a long time ago, I started a course, the amazing career project, 16 weeks on how to, you know, pivot or improve your career. And what I noticed is there are so many ways people learn and so many ways that things get through. So I wanted to give in this book and anything that I do a lot of different frameworks mm -hmm. that, and what do I mean by that? So the seven bravery boosting paths are the antidotes to each power gap. So they are brave sight, seeing yourself bravely, brave speak, brave ask, brave connection, brave challenge, brave service, and brave healing. But within that, when you read the book, I hope you will find this. There isn't just my advice. Sometimes I just get tired hearing myself talk. There's 30 plus national experts on every topic you can imagine from confidence to negotiating to networking up. There's also their strategies in these bravery boosting paths so that my my prayer is there's something for everyone. So if you read this strategy, but think, I don't, that doesn't speak to me. There are 10 other strategies. So um, that's how I approached it, that let me make this very robust. But it also started with, and I do love doing this, these women I've worked with and men who've overcome these gaps have been brave and powerful. Let me ask what they did. Yeah. Let me, let me hear from them about the steps they took. So the chapters cover what they did yeah. and then add some additional ways to look at it and steps to take. And I, I think, uh, you know, I've got that chart with the gaps plus the, uh, the, um, 
boosting paths that you have. And I think it's really incredible just to keep that as a, as a framework. But one of the other things that I really like, and I don't know how other, uh, other readers of the book um, or listeners, because I know some people uh, listen to it instead of read it. Um, the other thing that I found was in each chapter, so for each of these gaps, you gave us the opportunity to do three things. So there was another framework that you also used, which was you, you almost not mandated, but ex uh, invited us to look internally, so that internal reflection, to evaluate things externally. What can I do externally? What are the things outside of myself? But then also you had, um, what was the third? A positive Reef. reframe. And I, I, reframe. I'm, I'm an optimist, optimistic realist, um, but I love the positive reframe. Can you speak to why you selected those uh, three elements? I love that question. You asked such good questions. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I want to start with the reframe. And a lot of this comes from therapy training where it's so... Um, it just frees people in such great ways. But I learned as a marriage and family therapist, which is a particular genre, and it's very systemic based and communication based and behavioral, behaviorally solution focused. I learned that how we think about a problem can either make it intractable and impossible to address, or it can open possibility. So I want to give you an example of a reframe. So sometimes people come to me and say, I'm just such a loser. You know, they'll, they won't say those words, but, and I'll say, tell me what you mean, Mary. Well, I've interviewed 10 places and I've gone all the way to the end and I don't get the job. Something's wrong. And I start by asking this, do you want these jobs? And there's usually a pregnant pause and they go, no. I said, then listen to me carefully. You're not a loser. You are, your system is giving you exactly what it wants. You don't want this job. You're not being a loser. You're going for the wrong jobs. And I can watch their entire face change. So a reframe is a story that fits the facts. I do not believe in lying. I do not believe in exaggerating. Never lie on LinkedIn. Never lie on your resume. Because when you lie, you're telling yourself, I don't have what it takes to deal with reality. It's incredibly limiting for you. But anyway, um, the reframe allows you to tell the story in a way that fits the facts perfectly well, but it allows for more uh, positivity, more self-trust, more self-love, more expansion. So anytime you're really struggling, like, gosh, I'm screwing this up. I'm not moving forward at all. Wait a minute. What's another way to look at it? So the reframe is so important. The second step is this, you know, a lot of people have said to me, how come I've taken 17 courses and read 48 books and been on retreats and I am not getting what I want? I'm not moving forward. So the other thing I want to teach here is insight is great, but insight doesn't change your life. It doesn't change your life. It's action that changes your life. And it's typically action unlike anything you've ever done before. It's braver. So the other two aspects of the brave pathways are first internally look at what's going on and how can you become stronger internally, but that's not enough. You have to demonstrate that in your actions and your communication and how you're relating and how you're relating to your boss and how you're talking about yourself and thinking about yourself, but you have to take action. So it's those things that come together, I think, that work. Yeah. Yes. And one of, and, and Kathy, one of the things that I, I know that we've had conversations with some people who are on this, uh, on this call, it does take work, right? And, you know, even mm -hmm. when I was looking at some of your questions, I've got a to do uh, or uh, oh boy think about this question because there's some tough questions and we sometimes in the hurry of life or in the you know let me put my hat over it and not really think about it we don't want to ask or answer uh, or think about those tough questions so it is uh, having that um, framework and having those specific questions that you've got in each chapter. There were some that I kind of went, oh God, do I really want to think about this? Um, what what <laughs> did I come oh. up with? Because it takes it takes some effort and some work, right? And that's where I hope that people can share with others. I, I just any comments about that? Yes, I love your point. You know, somebody told me I read your book and 
it's kind of like a workbook. And he had a problem with that. And I said, it is a workbook, but here's what I've found. I think some people learn by reading a story like Cheryl Hunter. They read that and they can extrapolate steps to take from that story. I never was like that. I liked prescriptive, <laughs> do these seven things and see what happens. But the truth is this is work, but so is building a brave and powerful life that you love. Yeah. If it were that easy, we'd all be flipping around doing it. You know, it's, it's not easy. Yeah. And, you know, somebody said to me in one of my courses, I want to be like you. And, uh, you know, I believe that if you find your right work, you never work a day in your life. That's nonsense. I, I mean, work is work now. I mean, work is not going to the movies. Work <laughs> is negotiating your talents for money. Work is having boundaries and saying the hard things and stretching yourself and being a leader and managing people that maybe you don't like. It's work. But if you're in the right career, it is the most rewarding and fulfilling and you feel you're in the right place in this world. So suffice it to say, there's work to be done yeah. if you want change. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And and uh, I'm, I'm with you on that quote. I used to be one who would uh, espouse the, if you find work that you love, you won't work a day in your life. And over the last little while, I, you know, the last several years, no, hang on a second. Um, you work is work and they are separate things. So I'm, I'm glad to hear you have that conversation. I'd like to hear if others uh, are believers of the one phrase or the other phrase as we move forward. Uh, and remember, please put your questions if you have in the chat or any comments in the chat and we'll, we'll give, we'll open it up uh, in a few minutes, but just a few more questions. Um, I think you talked about the research and one of the things that I really mm. welcome about the book is that it's, it's based on your experience, but you also did some research, you did the surveys, and you've talked about a few of the results, but what was the biggest surprise that came to you when you started evaluating the research? Oh, what a great question. So when I did market research in the past, what, what you find is you can kind of have a self-fulfilling prophecy in research, because for instance, if a ton of people are following me on LinkedIn, they're following me because I'm talking about things that, that, they resonate with, right? So if I only do a survey to my newsletter followers, I'm going to get a skew here. I'm going to get, you know, so I decided to, to put this out in a very big way, not just my newsletter, but wherever I could. So every social media, you know, I had friends sharing the links. So it wasn't my insular circle. Mm -hmm. The biggest shock was that 98% of women have these gaps. I, that's what I saw in my qualitative work because they're coming to me for a reason. But I was so floored that around the world and it doesn't matter the age. And in fact, there, there are three gaps that younger, a younger group, 18 to 30, 18 to 24 have more. And that's not recognizing, recognizing their talents, reluctance to ask for what they deserve. And I think it's acquiescing instead of saying stop to mistreatment. And you can understand when you're just starting out, you don't know what's hitting you. You don't even know if that is mistreatment, but I have to say the proliferation of these gaps was staggering to me. Yeah. The, and I'm glad that you did that research so broadly, right? And you're able to bring in those those figures into your research and into your work. The one that you mentioned just now in terms of younger people, I don't think it's only young people because I, I know there's some fabulous individuals on this call. And I think the chapter that, that um, and the issue of women in particular, some men as well, speaking up and asking for promotions or, you know, when am I going to make a partner? When am I going to get that next managerial role? Or when am I going to get that stage of my business that I want to get to? Um, the fact that they, you know, they're a little bit unsettled in asking for those things uh, and find it unnerving. I have, you know, students and lawyers who have come to me who said, I'm really great at my work, but boy, how do I ask for that next, you know, that next stage? So can you help uh, give us some, some suggestions right now? I know it's in your book, but just because that's a common factor and theme that I often hear together with some of the other things, 
how can a woman do this more effectively and confidently? And I'm using, I love it. So I want to break it into two. I want to break it into asking for a raise, uh, and then asking for advancement. So, you know, obviously I love research and data because I think a lot of people are skeptical. Yeah, that's not really a problem, but when you give them data, they're like, oops, let me give you a piece of data. There was a research study that looked at men and women right out of business school who were getting their very first job. And here's the data. 57% of men negotiated their very first salary and 7% of women did. If that is happening to you, to me, look how much money, advancement, plum assignments, compensation, benefits we are leaving on the table. We are going to be behind, so much behind where we could be in 10 years and behind our male counterparts. And there are reasons for this. Part of the patriarchal world is women are taught and conditioned not to ask for what they want, not to put themselves forward, not to sound too assertive. I mean, there's so much data on this. So, but but we can't sit back and say, it feels uncomfortable. We have to do it, right? So let's just talk about that for a minute. Well, it's true for advancement as well. What I talk about in the book and teach over and over is a, a lot of times we'll, we'll think, I just deserve it. I, I've done a good job as a manager. I deserve to be director. That is not true. You were hired to do a good job as a manager. Being ready to be director typically means, or you know, vice president to senior vice president, president to whatever, typically means you're at a higher level uh, overseeing a different kind of purview and potentially managing more people, managing more in initiatives. You have to prove that you're ready for that. You have to build a case. And the case is fact-based. It's not emotional. It's not, I want it. It's, I deserve it. And in that case, you are looking at competitive salary through salary.com, glassdoor.com, you know, people with this credential, with this, with this many years, and you know, with this experience of Jenna making 150,000, whatever it is, you come with information. You also come with demonstrations of the impact that you've made. So you, for instance, have brought in 10 clients worth $3 million. You have streamlined marketing processes that have saved blip. You have, you know, innovated a new product in a new language, in a different language that generated this. You, you prove it with data and metrics. On top of that, this is where the mentorship and sponsorship is really important. So one thing I'll tell everybody, you know, I love LinkedIn. To me, it's the big cocktail party in the sky. <laughs> Imagine you can be in the room with a thousand people who inspire you from all over the world. That's LinkedIn. A lot of people say, oh, I don't want to go on that. I don't know what to say. And isn't it really for people just looking for jobs? No, no, and no. Get on LinkedIn. And, you know, I'm on there so often I can look at your profile and in five minutes, I probably know more about your career than you know about your career. I'm not kidding. I can tell when you're hiding. I can tell when you are not happy where you are. I can tell where you don't know what your special talents are. I can tell when the story doesn't fit together. Wow. She's over here, over here, over here, over here. I don't get it. What's going on here? That's often when people don't actually proactively go for jobs they just let stuff come to them because they're nervous. Do you understand what I'm getting at? Mm -hmm. So part of this is also get on LinkedIn, get recommendations, give recommendations and endorsements and get them and get them from where you work so that when you're going for that promotion and advancement, it's not just you speaking of you, you have a folder of, and here's some that you leave. And here's some endorsements I have about the impact I've made. And hopefully they're at from high level or, you know, inspiring people. But I hope you're understanding that what I'm saying is it's not an emotional thing. It's here's the facts, here's the case, and here's the impact I'm going to make on the system. A company, a business, a, a law firm, it's a system. This is the impact that I'm going to make when this happens. I'm I'm a really big believer about emotions and emotional intelligence. And I'm glad that you said this isn't about emotions because I've I've heard 
um, enough people come into a request for a promotion or um, higher salary with um, the the examples of, look, I've got two kids at home, or I'm a single mom, or I just moved to the city and it's much more expensive than the previous place I have. And I look at them and said, yes, those are legitimate issues for you personally, but how are they going to help you in getting that next promotion? So the evidence and the, I use the word evidence, so my apologies, um, but what's the, what are the facts? What's the, what's the data that you need to be able to confirm and, and show somebody else you're ready for it, right? So I think that emotions are important in much of that we do, but not in this instance in particular. I love it. There's another thing I have people or ask people to think about. Some people will reach out to me on LinkedIn and say, you know, I'm going for this job, but I don't have, you know, uh, relatable experience. And I'm very upset. All the hiring managers want that. It's not fair. Mm -hmm. So I'll say to them, you know, with the kindness, all the kindness I can muster, put yourself in their shoes. They're about to hire someone for $60,000 or 80 or a hundred. They want someone who can hit the ground running doing that job. And they want you to prove that you can. Wouldn't you like, like I have my own business. I hire contractors. They, I need them to demonstrate like my social media manager or my tech support manager. They have to demonstrate that they can do the 50 things I need them to do because I'm about to pay them quite a lot. Uh, so you have to put yourself in the hiring manager's shoes. Why should I put you in this spot? And how can you prove to me it's a wise investment for our business to give you this promotion and give you this raise? You know, Kathy, it's interesting. It just hit me that many people around the table are in that leadership role, potentially, or in that managerial role where they are making those decisions and might feel the flip side, uncomfortable having to have that tough conversation of saying, sorry, but not you're not ready yet or you haven't demonstrated it to us. So it's it's both, right? Having the conversation from both sides of the of the table. Potentially. It is. I mean, being a great leader, you know, I interview a lot of people about it. Wow. There's 10 billion books about it. Um, part of it is I feel that you have very clear communication. But also, if you want to be a great leader and manager, if someone's coming to you and they want the promotion or raise and you're not going to give it to them, they should be asking, okay, you're saying no now. Would you help me be on a development plan? And you have to, you have to be strong enough to tell them the truth. Yeah. Hopefully no, the good. answer is yes. I will, I will, and here's how, here's some things I think you would really need to develop and mm -hmm. grow in. And if you think that they're not ever going to be in, at the next level, it's something I think is important that you share in some way. Yeah, no, I agree totally. Um, now we're talking about promotions and your next steps. And, and you mentioned earlier dreams. And in chapter six, you talk about, um, and in a lot of the work that you do, Kathy, you talk about inspiring, encouraging women and men to reconnect. And I use the word reconnect because sometimes it's to connect for the very first time and other times it's to remember what those big dreams and passions are. You and I had this conversation before and I want to bring other people in. There are some people who hear that and think rather cynically, oh, your dreams and passions? No, no, no. They you just do the work, just get the work done. Can you tell us some of the experiences you've had and how you respond to that cynicism? And, and I love that in chapter, I think it was chapter, no, it was the trauma chapter where, no, in chapter six, uh, the, the example that you gave for weeks and weeks and weeks said, no, no, kept pushing, kept pushing until finally there was a breakthrough um, and that cynicism turned. Talk about reaching your dreams and overcoming the, the cynics potentially yeah. that are out there. You know, Sometimes this is ourselves. A, <laughs> this is a bugaboo for me. In our culture, and I'm an American, but I, I believe it's it's true in Canada and elsewhere, we are taught it's a bunch of nonsense to pursue your dreams. And we are taught that pursue your dreams and you're going to be broke and burnt out and you're going to lose everything. Boy, does that bother me. Um and, you know, I'll be honest, uh, my my dad has passed 10 years ago. He was 93 and mom's 98. They grew up in, you know, were born in the 20s. 
they went through World War II. They were not thinking about self-actualization. They were thinking about put the food on the table. So you have to understand that the messages you're getting, and I would ask you to think about what are the messages you got in childhood, because they're probably still there. But my, and this is not to blame our parents. They are doing the best that they can. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I'm going to blow it today as a parent. They're doing the best they can, right? But the messages I got were frugality, security. So dad was a GE guy, 30 years, seven patents. So I grew up thinking that's how I have to be. I need to be in a big, stable company. And now look at GE, you know, struggling. But um, I got messages that don't do some absurd, crazy thing. And I will even tell you, I'm a singer on the side. I've sung all my life. I've sung in St. Patrick's Cathedral. I've sung at Carnegie Hall for years. I sang at the UN with Liza Minnelli. Woohoo. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. And I, I never really wanted to make my living as, as a singer, but my ex, this is what he does. He's a well-known jazz percussionist and it's a struggle. It's hard. It's not easy, but I think when people say don't pursue their dreams, this is what they're really saying. This is what they're talking about. A lot of people, let's say you're in HR, you're a, a lot. I've worked with a lot of lawyers who are in a very toxic situation and they might say, I am so tired of being a lawyer. I'm going to go off and do this. I'm going to be a coach. The problem is for many people that do that, they have not vetted the direction or they're not ready to be entrepreneurs. I, I had one woman who was a very senior person at an academic university, made a lot of money, big, big job. And then she said, I'm going to quit. And my goal is to make $100,000 the first year. And I want to be empowering and encouraging, but I said, that's going to be incredibly difficult to make $100,000 as a coach. These five things have to happen, be happening. Well, she didn't want to hear any of it. Great. But, and sure, um, special instances happen. But when you fail at your dreams, it's often because I call it the pendulum effect. I made it up, but it's when you're, you're in a career and you're broken down in it emotionally. You can't, that's me, was me. I can't do this one more minute. So then you go eh, to the opposite ends of the world and think like for me, marketing VP to marriage and family therapist. I ran away to the opposite ends of the world thinking I will never have those corporate problems again. What happened? I get a master's, launch a therapy practice. And one of the three partners was a narcissist. I'm sitting there, something happened. It became clear. I said, I have to talk, something he did. I have to talk to you. He said, it's none of your business what I do in my personal life. I said, we have a therapy practice called Living in Harmony. It is my business. He said, no, it isn't, but out. And I had to leave the practice. And I had had a lot of narcissism. My point is, if you don't change yourself, if you don't empower yourself to be ready for these new challenges, nothing's going to change. You're going to find the same problems over and over. Secondly, if you don't vet these dreams, yeah. Like, I want to be a singer in the band. I'm going to give up my vice president you know, ship and be a singer in the band. And I think I'm going to make the same money. So it really bothers me when people say, don't pursue your dreams. What they're really saying is many people who pursued their dreams haven't vetted them, haven't done the internal and external work to make them a reality. So what I'd ask you to do in the book is this. If you have a dream and you think, boy, is that far away from what I'm doing now? I'd ask you to become now the person you dream to be. Dancers dance, writers write. Speakers speak, teachers teach. A lot of people, for instance, will come and say, wow, you wrote two books. I want to write a book, a best-selling book. Great. Are you writing anything? No, I'm not writing. How do you write a book if you're not writing one word? I, I call it, you've got to get on the path to natural goals. If you want to be a writer, you got to write. You got to start writing. So go to a writing workshop. I have a wonderful writing coach in LA. Amazing. Or write a blog post or write an article. 
if you want to sing, like here's another thing. Sometimes the dreams we have, they're not really best suited to how you make money. Like I need to sing to be happy. I, I'm in a group 17 years. I sing, I perform. If I don't have music in my life, I'm depressed. But that doesn't mean I want to make a living singing. I'm also a tennis player. I went to the States in tennis. I don't want to be a professional tennis player. Never did. So sometimes these dreams are telling you what you need to bring into your life. You miss art. You miss music. You miss volunteering. You miss pets. I'm going to volunteer in an adoptive dog program because I miss my deceased beagle so badly. And, you know, anyway, doesn't mean I want to be a vet. It means I need it in my life. So I would ask you to think about start being that person that is demonstrating what that dream is, but do it in a, a doable way where you're not chucking everything. Does that answer the question, Gina? It does, it does. I go and off I, on tangents. No, no, no. And I, I love the fact that you, uh, you know, again, the the example that you used in the book, um, your, your client had sort of taken steps to leave a corporate world and then to sort of start thinking about where she wanted to live and what she wanted to do and be, you know, she started thinking about, oh, travel blogs. And she discovered that she had actually started one years earlier and had forgotten about it right. um, as she, you know, as she, as she started thinking about it. So, uh, you know, people think somewhat cynically about dreams. And I, I really do appreciate that you remind us to reconnect with those dreams and do so in such a way that looks at whether it's the dream that you do to fill your life with joy while you might be working in something differently um, and it's still in a, in a positive way or that it becomes what you do on a regular basis. Cause I know there's so many talented individuals on this, uh, on this call right now who have a variety of different experiences that they are balancing between, do I do it as a hobby or do I do it as a full goal? Uh, and I think your I it, structures are, are really helpful. I've, I've got some questions. questions still, but we're going to open it up. If people have questions, there is the, uh, where the, where's the hand, there's a hand button, or you can just sort of wave to us. Um, if there are any questions for Kathy, please put up your hand and let's ask. Cause if not, I do have a couple more, but, um, let me just leave it over to the group first. Anybody want to? And ask? can I say this to you? For anyone who asks a question, everybody here is meant to be here and they will learn from your bravery. They have that question, but they're scared to ask. So will you be brave? There's no question too small, too big, stupid. Any question you have is meant to be asked. So will you ask it? I'm not doing my job here if you don't have questions. I'll just pause for a second. Ivana is trying to raise a hand. Can you tell folks how to raise a hand? Yeah. Ivana, oh. let's go. Thank you. Uh, if you can unmute and uh, and ask your question, please. Thank you. Thank you for being yes. brave, Ivana. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for all the great advice, uh, Kathy. And I really enjoyed the book. And uh, as Gina mentioned, uh, the examples really um, helped a lot with. Uh, I'm so glad. Uh, yes. And, and I like that the book is. Uh, um, written as a workbook it actually uh, forces you to think about things and uh, and reflect and I really like that oh, so um, but my question is uh, actually a very practical one um, mm -hmm. have you thought about prioritizing these gaps for example if you identify more than one gap do you actually start prioritizing you know what you need to start working on first and and how you go from there what a fantastic question. So if you were my client and, and it, let me just ask you, Ivana, how, how many of the gaps do you think you have? Oh, probably many. You know what I did? Okay. I, I first ordered a book and while I was waiting for the book, I went on uh, and, um, and filled out your survey because uh, I was curious. I probably should have read the book first and then uh, no, that's do the perfect. survey, but I was curious since I did the survey first and I thought, you know, I have maybe three gaps and yep. then when I read the book, um, the examples were actually very helpful because then I could understand what you what you actually meant. Um, and then, you know, some some of the gaps actually resonated more than the ones that I was able to identify in the survey. Okay, so beautiful. I have more uh, than one gap. <laughs> all right. So, you know, have you read Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs? Um, this is the way I want you to think about it. 
if you have more than one gap, the very first one to start with is number one. That's why I made it number one, not recognizing your special talents, abilities, and gifts. This is about every woman on the planet. So if we don't recognize, like for me, let me give you an example quickly. When I look back at me at 16, what was I? I had a I had a keen interest in words and writing, right? I was a singer back then, so I loved being on stage. I had a, a psychological therapeutic ear. My friends would call me up, boys and girls, and say, can I talk to you? I have a problem. And I'd say to my mom, what are they asking me for? I'm 16. I don't know anything. But even then, I had a, a therapeutic ear, right? And I was very psychologically oriented. What, and, and I was a writer on the new school newspaper. Why did I not recognize those? Because when we're good at things, we think everybody's good at those. They come easily to us, standing up on stage in front of a thousand people. Yes, another person would rather stab themselves with, you know, with a fork before doing that. So what I want you all to do is take some time to answer those questions about how am I gifted? And I mean gifted. Like every one of us is like a thumbprint, unlike anyone else in the world. Now you're not more amazing than another human being. You're just amazing. I mean, maybe you are more amazing, but you know what my point is. You're all amazing. But if you don't recognize that, you're going to be in the wrong jobs. You might be in the wrong relationships. You're not leveraging those talents. Your job, you may be good at it but it doesn't come easily to you. So this is another thing. We have skills and we have talents. Skills are those things you hone. Talents come naturally. You don't want to build a career with skills that are hard. I did that. So Ivana, start with number one. And then you kind of answered your own question. As you read the book, think about who you really resonate with. When you read the examples like Cheryl Hunter or the other names that, you know, I, I remember them as real people, but I had to change their names. So I don't want to say them, uh, but Diane, if you say, oh my, that sounds just like me, how I feel, then that's where you should start. Use the book as your guide. Are you going to tackle all of these at once? No, I don't, I don't recommend it. I do think that one and two cluster powerfully. When you don't believe that you're talented and gifted and important, you're going to communicate from fear. So one thing I talk about in the book that I always think about my son, we're really close and me too with my daughter, but what I find is women apologize. And the research shows that women apologize exponentially more than men. They say the words, I'm sorry. Like I almost said it the other day, you know, when I was reaching over someone, it's not, I'm sorry, it's excuse me. Or you're standing in line, you're standing in a long line at the grocery store and someone cuts you off. And women will say, I'm sorry. There's a line. You're not sorry. You're mad. <laughs> Don't say the word sorry. So this now is resonating I with many. I can see the faces around. I'll say it. <laughs> and so I say now it just happened to me. Where was I? Starbucks long line. Some guy comes right up. And I, I almost said, I'm sorry. And I said, excuse me, there is a line and it's behind me. You know, I wasn't mean about it, but my son said, oh, mom, you're making a big deal. It's just an idiom. No, it's not just an idiom. Every word you say broadcasts a message to the person who hears it. If you say you're sorry, it weakens you. It means you're in the one down position. Anyway, I can go on forever. Ivana, what I would say is start with one and two, but then look at the book and who do I resonate with? What is the problem that I feel? Another way to look at it is where do you feel the most pain in your life? Where are your boundaries being violated? Where do you, pain, you know what pain is. Where do you feel disrespected, not recognized, not loved, not appreciated? Start there and find a bravery boosting path that's going to address that. Does that help? Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Great. Wonderful question. Thank you. I appreciate that. Brave. Anybody? Oh, sorry, is that a great question? Anybody else uh, have a question for Kathy while we've got her? Anne. Welcome. Hi, Anne. Hi, Anne. Hey. <laughs> oh, we got questions. I love it. Um, I found in going through the questions and going through the content, um, 
it's easier for me to make sense of it from a professional perspective or from, you know, any sort of external accomplishment. Do you have any guidance as to how to go about addressing the gaps from a personal perspective? Love it. Can you give a little more of an example? Um, are you having a particular issue, for instance, and you'd like to close a gap there, but don't know how to apply? Well, it? for me, basically, you know, I've spent the time since law school, basically focusing entirely on my career, finally got to the point where that's settled. Um, right. I could go through examples throughout the entire book in terms of, you know, how I got there, but um, managed after a lot of work to sort of get to the point where, you know, things are, things are going very, very well for me professionally, yeah. but um, having uh, completely uh, neglected my personal life for a decade or so, um, I'm trying to rebuild that now in terms of personal relationships and, you know, trying to find um, my own identity in that perspective. And so, oh, there are gaps. There are many, many gaps. I just have a harder time uh, wrapping my head around how to go about doing that work from a personal perspective than from a professional perspective. You know what I, I'm thinking? And so uh, bear with me. Sometimes I just get a feeling when I'm talking to a person. I could be wrong, but I think I'm an HSP and I'm also someone who senses. So please forgive me if I'm off base. But what came up for me when you, where'd you go? What, what came up for me when you spoke is childhood. Um, and we won't do therapy here, but, um, you know, I'd say yes or no. Did you come from a situation where your family applauded your special talents and acknowledged you for your special talents? Or did they sometimes have to go underground, maybe because there was a sibling or someone else who was getting attention. Did you feel you could be recognized for some of the great stuff you did then? Typical kind of immigrant thing where it's like, oh yeah, that's good. You're really smart. You're uh, fortunately I got um, praised for being smart and strong, um, but uh, it was never enough, but that's typical immigrant upbringing. I think. <laughs> you know, my parents were second generation Greek and Italian. I would get all A's and an A minus and dad would say, and he didn't mean it, but he'd say, what's the A minus? What happened with the A minus? Yeah. yeah. I I wanted them to take me out to dinner, you know, like, it's, uh, I, you know, I'd be whatever. Let's not go there. Um, what I will tell you is, you know, one of my favorite statements is you are what your childhood taught you to be unless you unlearned it. That is allowing the past to continue to define you. Let me explain some things. Every high achieving woman, I, woman I've ever worked with or met is a perfectionistic overfunctioner. That you're nodding. I mean, people <laughs> laugh, like they know what it is in a minute. It means you're doing more than is healthy, appropriate and necessary, but that's not enough. You're also trying to get an A plus in all of it. On top of that, a perfectionistic overfunctioner, the bar is always moving. So you get here and you just raise the bar because you're never good enough. Most of us learn this in childhood. I mean, all A's and an A minus, you know, I guess not good enough to dad because he was brilliant and a Phi Beta Kappa and a photographic memory and a scientist. <laughs> the problem is if you don't, heal that, it will show up in everything you do in your personal life. It'll show up in every relationship. So does this resonate, Anne, at all? What I And you did something really interesting, which I think illustrates, we're tough, we're strong. You go, yeah, that's the immigrant mentality. And you, if you watch this video, you sloughed it off. Don't slough this stuff off now. That is going to be with you till the day you die, unless you change it. So part of this is loving yourself. Part of this is not being a perfectionistic overfunctioner. Part of this is recognizing what you're great at, going out and talking about it, finding groups that are doing that kind of thing. You know, it's wonderful to know you want to build a personal life, 
but it starts with loving yourself and then really getting in touch with what would it mean if in my spare time, I showed up in a bigger way. Like I love singing or I love this, or I, I actually was a really good painter when I was a kid and I loved that. Damn it. I'm going to go take a class. It means valuing yourself, but first you have to understand yourself. Is that helpful? <laughs> we can't <laughs> unmute. We're all sitting here with bated breath, not speaking. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, there's still a lot that I've got to do, but um, it's course. funny. You bring the example of a painter. I am a painter. I was, what? I trained. See? It's like <laughs> so, it. yeah. What? See, this is what's so crazy. Right? I mean, uh huh. I want you to be more of who you really are and love it. Love it more than you got. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. That's amazing. Uh, Sandra, you've had your hand up. Thank you, Anne. Sandra. That was beautiful, Anne. Thank you. Hi, Sandra. Sandra or Sandra? Sandra. Okay, great. Hi, thank you so much for uh, being here tonight and talking to us. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Gina, for arranging this. Um, I think one of the things that really resonated with me is the fact that you were talking about, you know, recognizing our special talents. And I think that, you know, um, at least as lawyers, I feel like, you know, you're kind of a, surrounded by a lot of people who have a lot of really great special talents. I don't know about everyone else, but I know for myself that one of the things, and I, and I think what you said about, you know, childhood having an impact really is there, um, is I was taught to be small without those words being used. Yes, you're very smart. You're very, very bright, but don't brag. Don't show it off to people. You don't want to, you, you, you don't want to overshadow people or outshine people. And so I kind of started to think that, you know, well, everyone's just as good as I am. And it, and then when you start to recognize that, no, actually, I'm, I actually excel here more than the average person, you start to feel, you know, conceited and that there's like this level of hubris that you've started to embrace. And then the other side of it, side of it is when you encounter people who aren't as skilled and talented as you are, but you've been conditioned to see everyone as being on this level playing field, you get frustrated and angry because you're like, how are you like, my synapses are firing at like a thousand miles a minute. How are you still stuck at go tying up your shoelaces? Like, let's get going here. Um, so when mm. you talk about recognizing special talents, it's kind of, it, it starts to become a little bit challenging to figure out. So is this a special talent or is this hubris? Like, where, where am I landing here? How do you, how do you, love how it. do you differentiate? All right, here it is. I grew up Greek and Italian, you know, mom would be like, tone it down. Like some lady in the grocery store recognized me for being in the play. And I, you know, I felt great about it. She's like, I don't like what I'm seeing here. And I remember she never even said, you look pretty. And she told me later, she's Greek. May the evil eye not see you, Gina, you know. I was like, I'm going to be smoked down by the evil eye. All right. This is what I want to tell you. There are ways you can appreciate your, your special gifts without it being braggarty, without it being hubris. You have to recognize that. And you're not saying you're better than another human soul. No, you're saying you have natural gifts from God, from the universe, from your higher power, from whatever you want to call it, that are standout talents that are there for the betterment of the world. They're there for you to use them. So this is a spiritual idea, but I'm going to, you're going to think, oh, she lost it. I believe you came into this world with a purpose and the purpose is to be of service in ways that are joyful to you that help other people. The happiest people in the world, uh, First of all, this is Maria Nemeth's book, The Energy of Money, incredible book. She says people are happiest when they're demonstrating in physical reality what they know to be true about themselves, when they're giving form to their life intentions in ways that 
help others. No truer, that's the guidebook for life. No truer words have ever been said. But if you're not even demonstrating what you know to be true, you are wasting this life. So part of this is you've got to heal from mom and pop. It's not hubris, but I want to give you a tip. This is how you talk about what you're great at. Let me explain. If people say to me, why should we hire you as a coach? I'll say four things. And I want you to listen and tell me, do you think this sounds like bragging? Brag, bragging. Number one, I spent 18 years in corporate life and I was a vice president. I lived the challenges of professional women. So I'm not guessing about them. I lived them. Number two, I became a therapist. So I go deeper than the average coach. So we're going to look at not just what's up here, but we're going to dig and get at the root of what is holding you back. Number three, I spent 16 years focused on professional women's challenges and wrote two books about them. I think I know more about professional women's challenges than most people on the planet. I believe that's true. And number four, I have my own business. So I'm an entrepreneur. I'm in the arena doing this hard stuff. I'm not just talking about it. Do you think that sounds like bragging? It doesn't sound like bragging because it's fact. It's not my opinion. It's fact. So what I want you to think about is how can you talk about your talents in a way that is fact? For instance, what's your lawyer? What's your, what's your specialization? Uh, I practice family law. Okay. So let's say someone says, why should I go to you versus this person? you're going to want to come up with a fact. Let's say it's, I've studied narcissistic personality disorder, this, that, and the other thing. I know more about this than, than most lawyers you'll ever meet. Or I have helped 2,000 clients do this. It's fact. Get over that sharing what you're gifted at, and gifted can be a word you get scared at, that you're great at. Like, I think I'm great at going deep. I can listen to your problem and go right there. Well, a person who hasn't had therapeutic training or been through these challenges isn't going to know how to do that. It's fact. Now, Sandra, you said something really interesting. You said, the other thing is, uh, my synapses are firing, and here's this person tying their damn shoelaces. If you listen to your voice, there's resentment there. There's anger there. I want to ask you, because I sense you're a compassionate person and we want to have compassion for people who don't, aren't as smart or haven't had the advantages of education that we have. We want compassion. What's the anger? I think it's sort of twofold. I think part of it is the assumption that we're on the same level, right? That's my mistake. Who is making that, that assumption? That I'm person? making that assumption where I'm sitting here and I'm uh -huh. treating other people at... Like I'm an Olympic runner and I'm mad at the kid who's, you know, getting the participation ribbon in track and field. So I can't, you know, just cause we all can run doesn't mean we all run at the same pace or at the same level, but the way that I've been conditioned Raised. to think is, yeah, that you're angry at your you're, parents. Yeah, a little bit, but I'm also, I, I, I guess in the moment you don't realize it, you're just looking at the other person, but I actually get really much more angry with myself. I get frustrated with myself because I feel like when I'm angry or frustrated with this person who is still tying their shoes, that I'm this awful person who isn't being yeah. generous and compassionate right. enough and I making room for them to catch up. Sandra, I'm going to give you a tip. Put yourself in the room with the, really think about it. I'm 10, I'm an Olympic, I'm a runner. Here's this kid who can't even tie the shoes. I don't think you're angry at that kid. You're angry at the world that you have been in that has told you you're the same as that kid. It's misplaced anger. You're not angry at that kid. So the minute you have that, Stop and go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is the internal. What am I angry at? Am I angry at that kid? No. And then you deal with why you're angry. Maybe you have to talk. Maybe your parents are alive. Maybe they're not. And you write them a letter. I'm angry because you made me feel like I wasn't special in any way. That's how I would deal with it. Is that helpful? It is. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.
Sandra, brave. thank you. No, I appreciate brave share. It, brave share. Brave share indeed. Um, Yanita, you've got your hand up. So I just sent a quick note saying we'll extend for a few more minutes if people can hang on. Uh, Kathy, are you okay to stay? For I'm one so minute? good to do it. I, I love it. Yanita, let's go with you. Nice to see you, by the way. Happy New Year. <laughs> I'm not who, who am who's talking you need it oh you need a hi I didn't see you there hello hello thank you Gina thank you Kathy this has been very helpful when I first read the the summary of the book I'm like I don't think I have any issues I think I'm good and then I started reading the book and I'm like wait I resonate with every chapter I find something that I'm like Oh, so maybe I, there's work to be done. So it's very interesting because uh, now I'm recommending the book to even my friends. I'm like, you should read this. You will realize that there is, there's work to be done. But what uh, a lot of things we touched on. So I just want to, something that stayed with me is something you mentioned in the book where women um, either discount or they don't, they give more time for, for if you price your services, for example, you always give out more time because you don't feel like it's, uh, whatever you're providing is important enough or is valuable enough for the how, however you've priced it and it's interesting because I'm a lawyer I'm a I'm a new lawyer I'm a third year lawyer and whenever I'm doing some work for a client I always go back and I say I spent 10 10 hours on this maybe it should have been 10 hours maybe it should have been eight maybe it should have been more productive was I thinking about this the entire time so I'm like okay let's not just put 10 hours let's just discount it and I I tend to do this a lot and it's been three years now especially when I'm doing something new and I don't know how much time it should take sometimes I ask and the lawyer I work with say oh, it should be two hours but honestly I don't think they remember how much time it took them when they did this for the first time and it's a it's a constant thing now and I'm realizing that it's also in other things because in the first chapter you're asking what are your talents and a lot of times I do things for my friends because I like photography I like helping them with a bunch of things and Sometimes I'm asked, so can I pay you? I'm like, no, 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 of course. It's like, you're my friend, I, I, no. And I'm like, I cannot accept money. So that's a thing, that, that's a problem for me that I have to identify maybe I don't see whatever I'm offering as something valuable. Or maybe there's a trauma that you're supposed to give more than you're receiving. So I don't know if anyone resonates with this. We I all really resonate with it, we all do. All right, let me give you some tips. You know, I'm in the world of pricing my things and there's reasons why, you know, I've just reduced my prices and I give things for free because I don't just want to work with wealthy people. It's hard to price. But when you price things, what you have to hold tight to is what is the value of this hour that I'm giving? What is the value? What are they getting? And am I, did I give everything I've got? to do this. And yes, of course you want to be competitive. You don't want to be charging a thousand when everyone else is charging 200 and you can't demonstrate why it's worth a thousand. So you're in a business. You, so it's, it's pricing is a whole, you know, situation. However, what I see with women is they are always discounting literally and figuratively and if they spend 10 hours, they're afraid it was, they're stupid and it should have been six hours. What I'd ask everybody to do right in this moment is stop doubting yourself. If you've assessed that it's $300 an hour, that it's worth it, you spend eight hours, charge that. But the funny thing is what women tend to do is, and men, some men too, they cough up a hairball when they say it's going to be $300 an hour. <laughs> They can't even say it because they don't believe in themselves. It's time that you, you really understand the value that you offer and you put a price tag to it and, you're, and you stay firm with it. In the beginning, it's hard. But what you don't want to do is continually discount. You don't want to continually think I'm, I'm not quick enough so it should be eight hours. It was your 10 hours. And you're a special individual that's giving something maybe that someone else isn't. So number one, stop doubting, stop worrying. The piece also about not charging your friends for photography or, or whatever. What I have a process for that. I remember years ago when I was just starting out, I was 200 an hour, 150. And a friend in my town had recommended her friend. I said, I'm 150 an hour. It, this friend of mine, I found out, said, well, she must need the money to charge. That made me so mad. If you're selling cars, are you going to give a car away to your friend? 
right now there is a way to do it. I have a friend and family discount. So I will give you 20% off or 30%. I'm helping someone in my church. I don't want him to pay me. And he's like, I'm not comfortable you doing anything. He gives so much to us. I'm happy to give this for free, but there'll be a limit to it. I'm not going to give 10 sessions for free. I can't because I have. So what you have to do is sure with friends and family, you want to give them a break. Let's say you're going to do legal work for a dear friend. You can say, this is what I'm comfortable with. Let me share. I can give five hours, maybe two hours, one, but going forward, I'd love to give you my friend and family rate. How would that be? And you have to you have to start being good at asking for what you deserve and stop questioning it. Would anyone else agree or disagree? I think this is one of the hardest questions that we have. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to. Yeah. Who else? Yeah, one of the hardest questions that a lot of professionals or people have is is how they charge, uh, how they price it, so how they value themselves, right? In whatever we do. So great question, Anita. Really I'm also going to say this. I was with um, family friends and one of the young guys uh, who I helped for free, he said in front of the whole group, uh, Kathy, I really want to say he's 25. I really want to send people your way, but you're expensive. And he looked at my son and he said, do you know how much your mother charges? And he was shaming me. He was shaming me. And I was so angry, like, don't you shame me in front of my family, friends, and my son. Um, and, and again, I did just lower my prices because of the economic and financial crises so many people are going through. But we have to, we have to and numbers can fluctuate. You can change them, but you can't change them simply because you don't feel good enough to change them, yeah. to, to stay with them. Change them because it's an analytic decision. An, an intellectual, not an emotional, I'm not good enough. I hope that's helpful to people. That was very helpful to me. Good. Thank Beautiful. you, Anita. We are really um, uh, 10 minutes over and I want to be respectful of people's evenings, Kathy, your evening in particular. So I wanted just to take a couple of seconds and remind us um, of some emails that uh, you have available to you. If you, hopefully you're seeing Kathy and I on this page. <laughs> um, uh, if I can get a, yes, okay, good. I see um, it, yep. Good, you see it. So one of the things that Kathy's going to, has um is going to we're going to share with everybody uh afterwards is a workbook so if you do want to if you do like the workbook idea and want to dig a little bit deeper you're going to get that by uh email in the next couple of days um she's got some great materials available on her website um on linkedin she's got a, a huge um uh, amount of resources and so thank you kathy for for joining us thank you to everybody for being part of this launch book club launch just a reminder that the next one is happening um on february the 20 the, sorry february the 28th uh it is a tuesday going forward it is tuesdays with norm bacall we'll have a different conversation with uh with norm bacall um about careers again it's always marrying career conversations in some way shape or form with an author uh, and so i'm hoping that you're able to join us i hope that you can share the information to friends and colleagues Kathy, I'm just going to close with the following. Um, in your acknowledgement at the very end, you state, and finally to about your acknowledgement in your book, you say, and finally to every woman in the world who isn't afraid to embrace the brilliant light she carries inside and is willing to bravely step up to sharing her light even more brightly. Well, this is your book just as much as it is mine you wrote. So a huge thank you to you, Kathy, for embracing, um, offering us ways to embrace our power and our bravery and for embracing and sharing your brilliant light with us. Oh, I am yeah. absolutely honored and, and thrilled to have you as our inaugural uh, author today. So <laughs> thank you very much. And thank, thank you to everyone. Thank you so much for, for, for having me. And thank you, everyone. Thank you for your brave questions. So great to meet you. Gina, do you mind if I say one thing? Um, this is a brave, a brave speak here. I Unbelievably, you are um, you held this on the last day of uh, early bird enrollment for my most powerful you course, which is eight weeks. So I won't say any more, but go to mostpowerfulyou.com if it speaks to you. It's eight weeks with me and and all training videos. So and I'd love to work with you. But so thank you for letting me say that promotional 
statement. And I've really so enjoyed getting to know you all a little bit. Thank you, Gina. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Stay safe. Stay warm wherever you are. Take care. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.